Look at this torque converter. Right? This is where your clutch rides against the um, crankshaft side of the torque converter. And this thing is absolutely blue because that torque converter clutch got so hot. And I have to assume that you were, <laughs> if you were inside this bell housing while this was going on, this would probably be glowing like red in there. So I, I don't even want to um, rebuild this torque converter. You know, there's no way that um, everything in there is straight and not warped. So this has got to go, but this is extraordinary. Like I've never seen like a Tundra torque converter get blue like this. Today we have another Toyota AV60E out of a Tundra. I'm not sure the year. This is from Andrew at Trail Command. This is a pretty extreme build. He's doing some desert racing. It's supercharged. I think he said it's somewhere around 700 horsepower at the crank. Um, it came in with a, a bunch of problems, uh, clutches slipping, the code 2757. I'm going to show you the torque converter um, in a little bit. It's kind of extraordinary what happened to it, but now we're going to get inside this thing and see what he's got going on here that, that uh, made it fail. All right, I'm going to start by getting rid of most of these 14 millimeter bolts, starting with the transfer case adapter. And this is siliconed on, so it typically is going to need a couple shots to take it off. Not too much you have to worry about back here. Just a uh, sealed bearing to make sure it's got no crunchiness to it. And the end of your output shaft. And this thing, um, I wish we had smell-o-vision. This thing smells horrible, so I'm sure we're going to find some pretty severely damaged clutches in here. Bell housing out of the way. And if you're working on one of these, you could see these bolts are different. Right? The bell housing bolts have a little washer on them. Okay, so this is getting used for um, desert racing. So what we have here is, is um, the factory setup that most of them have. This goes with the tow package. So this um, contains antifreeze, and it actually preheats your transmission fluid. This is a bypass valve that flows the coolant to your radiator, your cooler, and then back to the transmission but it's got a bypass assembly in it. So before this thing is warmed up, it just circulates it through this heater and it warms your transmission up faster. Then this thermal valve opens up and allows it to flow through your whole cooling system. And it could be a reliability issue. So Andrew wants me to get rid of all of that. And what we're gonna do, that's the part number. It's a 90407-14034. And this is out of some other models. So we're going to get rid of that and we're going to put two of these on. So it's not going to have any thermal bypass or anything like that. It's going to just have straight, reliable cooler flow at all times. And I don't do this on all of them, but it's not a bad idea. Especially if you don't live in a really cold climate. You know, if you live in Minnesota or something like that, you might want to keep it on to let your transmission warm up because it might take for, uh, forever otherwise. So there's two pieces here. This is um, Tane's antifreeze. If you're changing these, there's O-rings 
that come in your rebuild kit that squash down onto here. Then on the other side, there's more O-rings that squash between here and here. Now these things are also threaded, so it's kind of, you know, you get the idea. But I was also asked to see if I could find some AN fittings that are going to fit in here and work correctly. So if I can, I'm going to put those part numbers in too, because a lot of you guys at this point have um, braided lines, etc., etc. The manual lever switch we've discussed in other videos, I'm probably just going to leave it here. This thing looks like I'm going to need to take the hot wrench to it or um, maybe remove it from inside the valve body, as I've shown in other videos. But for now, it stays. We're just kind of doing an exploratory here. I'm probably going to do a couple different videos with this transmission. Now, um, this code 2757, which is indicative of a converter clutch slip, there's several things that could cause it in any transmission. If your front stator bushing wears out, your converter apply oil could kind of go back in that way and uh, cause it to burn up. But on these things, the stator bushing, I've never even seen anywhere whatsoever on them. So it's not a problem in these, but if you're working on something else, it's really critical. Like especially, let's say, um, front wheel drive Fords, they're known for that. It just, it wears that pushing out and it, it cooks the torque converter. So unfortunately, for the purpose of the video, these things aren't that user friendly in the sense that I'm going to have to take off the pan and the valve body and all that other stuff to get this transmission apart. And uh, we have an aftermarket temperature sensor that's welded into the pan. And uh, this looks like a pretty nice job. You see a lot of times people do um, some half-assed stuff there. And also to note, there's two different pans on these Toyotas, and I don't know if it's a year change, but some of them have a little angle to them here. Like this style might have slightly higher capacity. And as most of you guys know, if you're working on these things, that they love to break pan bolts. But um, I think we're going to get lucky here because this is a California vehicle and uh, the rust doesn't look too bad. We're here in New York City, so it's... <laughs> There's a lot of road salt, and you know, if you do stuff from up in New England, it's uh, they get really crusty underneath. Like you guys know how the whole bottom of these trucks rust out, including the frame. So far, so good. So it's kind of a pro tip, which really isn't that much of a secret. Um, if these things are rusty, you want to spray the hell out of them with a, you know, a PB blaster or some kind of nut buster, which I don't know how much that helps. But also, uh, some guys get up here and the bolt that's sticking out, you hit it with a, a wire brush, preferably on an air tool, and you clean all this crust off the top of the bolt, because sometimes that's what snaps them. When it's got a big deposit of rust up here, then you try and pull it through there, it snaps the bolt. So not too much metal. This looks like it's probably an original filter. Even on the originals, I don't usually see a white ink stamping like that. So I've gone over this before, but there's a trick to get rid of some of these. In that case connector you want to get in there and whoops do too well there and there's another trick i'm not going to bother with it now but if you have one that's pretty crusty you could kind of hit these with a heat gun a little bit you know in a sane way you don't want to cook them but just um make them a little uh more pliable
and this stuff I've gone over, um, you know, a bunch of times in other videos. Seems like I'm making more and more AB60 videos. I hope you can get a close up in here. This is the technique you get in here and you push out. And we have two different style filters on these. This one that oval is halfway closed up. And this um, also matches the style of pan, as I discussed before. You have an O-ring in here. You want to make sure that's not crushed or damaged or anything like that. And we have two temperature sensors. And we just did another video. There's a whole thing on these valve bodies and people on eBay selling the incorrect valve bodies. But the uh, long and short of it is that there's two kinds of valve bodies. They don't really interchange. You have a one sensor style and a two sensor style. So these are both temperature sensors. And they both have holes that they plug into. And your orange one's always going, going on the side of the linkage. So if you have to interchange these, say you have a Lexus, uh, like an A760, A761, they usually have the one temperature sensor. So you can use an AB60 valve body on them, but what you have to do is either find an extra sensor and plug it in there along with its bracket that holds it down or you can hammer a 3 8 cup plug which is a pretty common item in transmission shops it's a uh, you know related to a lot of GM stuff your rebuild kit will come with the 3 8 cup, cup plugs and you know it's for a, a parking linkage and you never end up using them when you do those transmissions so you typically will have a bunch of them laying around so now have to get the wiring harness out of the way and the battery bolts. All right, this is what we call a detent spring where some manufacturers call it a leaf spring. And it's a little bracket that, I guess, adds additional force on it. And this hooks to what we call a rooster comb. So this is each of your gears, park, reverse, neutral, drive, etc. See if this will behave for me for a minute. All right, so you don't have to take all these bolts out. But most of them you do. Oh, got one more left. There we go. So another thing, um, if you have an AB60, this is typically the casting number on the valve body. You're going to have an 89010. And we went to, into it in another video. <laughs> a lot of these valve bodies are selling as AB60 on eBay. That hole is going to be closed up because it's not for an AB60. It's for an A761. It's like in some Lexus models, um, trucks and passenger cars. And it's in Tundras with the uh, small V8, not the 5.7. On the back side, oh wow, you could already see that these clutches are destroyed in here. We'll get to that in a minute. 
Same thing here, though. You're going to have a 89-010. But that's not to say that it makes it right. I've actually seen 760 valve bodies with this casting number. Oh, this one's what? This is an 89-020. Okay? But, again, the casting number doesn't mean it's right. I've even seen valve bodies out of the 5-speed that would have the same casting number, and obviously it's a completely different valve body. Okay, accumulator pistons and springs. I don't know if you can see that. This thing is like level. It's supposed to look like that. Right? They get scored and they wear out. So we're going to have to clean up this bore. And our, there are aftermarket pistons that are a different design. And they have um, an O-ring or two O-rings in them. So they seal off a lot better. But under here, you're going to have these two springs. And I get this question a lot because I do a lot, of, a lot of valve bodies for people. So when they're putting them back in, sometimes they don't know where these springs go. We have this, which is a cooler check valve. So fluid pumps it that way and holds it off its seat on the valve body when your car is running. When it shuts off, it comes back here. And what that does, it keeps your converter and everything that's in your cooler from draining back into the pan because you can get what's called a drain back condition so in other words after something's sitting you go to put it in gear and there's kind of nobody home and that's because the torque converter is like half empty so you you know toyota did that to to solve that problem but i've never really seen it as um being a problem in toyota's you see it a lot in chrysler's and things like that and they finally went to a bypass assembly some of them uh, go in the cooler line, and they were failing in those things and uh, taking out the transmission. It was shutting off your whole lube circuit. Okay. So this piston, if you see, it says B-C3, right? So that's your, your third gear accumulator. And this piston is going to say B-B3 which is your second accumulator piston. So these springs are similar, but this one's got slightly heavier coils and it's shorter. And when we, we do valve bodies and transmissions, we put different springs in these, but we usually maintain the factory one, two accumulator, unless it's a real extreme duty application. Because what happens is these transmissions have a real low speed what I'm going to call a um, parking lot shift. So when you're at the supermarket, for example, and you're driving around at like three, four, five miles an hour, it makes a one-two shift. And it, it's not as noticeable with an unmodified transmission or unmodified valve body, but it becomes a lot more pronounced. So unless it's something extreme, we keep the one-two accumulator spring as it is. And this is why we got to take the valve body out we have these little seals here. And all this stuff needs to come out. We have these oil delivery sleeves. You know what? Just for fun, let's uh let's try something. Since this clutch pack is burnt out, let's uh see if we can air check it. So that's sealing hundred percent, but the clutches are cooked. So this is probably a question of this thing just being overpowered. That thing's checking a hundred percent as is that. So that's all, you know, hydraulically sound, but they're definitely cool. So next we could take this drum out, which contains a lot of stuff. And this transmission is kind of extremely overly complex to get six speeds. You know, you have a ton of clutch packs. You have, I think, four sprags. It's just, you know, it's not necessary. But that's how um, Asian Warner or Toyota decided to make it. Okay, so this, this drum has a lot of 
different functions in here, right? This is going to give you your higher gears, and it's also going to be reverse. Up here, we have a sprag. Turns in one direction, locks in the other. And that, that looks like it's in fairly decent shape, but definitely in an application like this, we're going to want to change it. Because when you make a one-two shift, all that load and all the power of your vehicle is locked on that sprag. And you got to remember, this thing's got a really low first gear. That's also the reason for that real low speed parking lot shift. It's like a, I don't want to, I want to say it 3.8 to one or something crazy like that. So that means before this thing makes a one, two shift, this drum is, is turning at you know, almost four times engine speed, which is pretty hairy. So as expected, this clutch pack is cooked. There's pretty much no lining left on these clutches. We got these two hubs, and this design is kind of uh, reminiscent of the old Chrysler 604, which at one time was the most advanced transmission there was. It had a whole multi-function drum like this. It was a pile of crap, but it was advanced. These plastic washers, obviously they don't do too well with heat. Now you have another drum within this drum. We have another one-way clutch in here. Turns in one direction, locks in the other. Couple bearings. Now these are your forward clutches, so in other words, when you put this thing in gear, these come on. You know, they're not responsible for making a shift or anything like that, but they come on in front of gear. And they're torched as well. Next, we have another set of clutches down here, and these are usually in pretty decent condition. And their only function is really when that sprag overruns, it grabs this set of splines and it keeps it from overrunning. So what that's going to do is give you engine braking. Like, for example, if you're going down a hill or something like that. You know, some cars, if you pull the shifter down a gear or whatever the case is, it's going to provide engine braking. But these Toyotas kind of do it based on computer, computer commands. So at any time it feels like it, you know, when it decides you should have engine braking, kind of turns those on. Which, um, you know, was kind of odd to me the first time I road tested one of these, because most things don't work that way. So these coast clutches are good. You know, we change all clutches when we do a rebuild, but these are all right. Now this snap ring only serves for this other clutch pack to apply against, right? So you have in here two snap rings that are exactly the same. This lower one holds another set of clutches in. And these are probably going to be fried too. And when we do these, we have... um steels that I've had made. Yeah, these things are really destroyed. They're starting to go metal to metal and it's, you know, they're getting a little spring to them, they're cone shaped. When we do these, we um, have thinner steels made and in conjunction with some machine work, we get some extra friction plates in there. I don't know how far I'm going to go with this as far as the disassembly, but again, I might do a few videos with this. This was, uh, Andrew kind of requested that I do a video taking his transmission apart. It's for his own curiosity. But this will be, I guess, what we call phase one. 
I really want to uh, open this valve body up too because a lot of times this code 2757, P2757, is related to converter clutch slip. So I'd be really interested to see how bad this valve body is worn in that converter clutch lineup. These are your second clutches. These are burning pretty bad. But this is another thing where we go from um, four clutches at the factory level. With our setup, we're able to get five in here, which helps a lot. I mean, these clutches burn, but they kind of hold up better than some of your clutches. You know, the ones to make a three, four shift. Or, you know, two, three shift, a three, four shift, and a five, six shift. That's usually the symptoms that you have um, that accompany these things failing. So some of these other snap rings are kind of a hump to get out of here. But let's see how we do. Try to do this so you guys can see. And I also don't want to splash my lovely assistant the transmission fluid when this pops out. But the way this thing smells, I may be sleeping on the couch tonight anyway. Okay, so when you put these in, these have holes where you could Sometimes get in here with snap ring pliers and squeeze this whole thing together and set it down. And again, it has a bevel on it. Okay, so the flat side of the snap ring is going to go down in the case. And the bevel is going to go towards the top. And let's try and get some of this stuff out. Actually, let me get this sensor out of here. So it doesn't interfere with anything. I'm gutting this thing out. Okay, so we have two sensors and they're the exact same part. They're an input shaft speed sensor and an output shaft speed sensor. And they don't really go bad that I've seen. But this is what's responsible for setting all your codes. Like for instance, if your computer sees a discord between your crankshaft RPM and your input shaft RPM, it knows your converter clutch is slipping or it's off. But your computer knows when it turns it on. If it turns it on and it doesn't see that RPM drop far enough, it's going to set that 2757 code because it knows your, your converter clutch is slipping. Now, for your other codes, they would be gear ratio error codes in most transmissions, but Toyota blames everything on solenoids, whoever wrote the software or however it gets done. So... By comparing input shaft speed and output shaft speed and we'll use fourth gear because it's simple it's one to one so if you have 2000 rpms here and you have 1500 rpms here it knows you're <laughs> you're losing 500 rpm so this thing is is slipping but again these things don't set gear ratio codes or anything like that they basically um We'll set solenoid codes, solenoid, uh, usually a B, uh, a D, or the common ones, which just means that it called for that solenoid to do something, and it didn't see that happen. These are your little sleeves, you know, they get sandwiched between the valve body and the clutch pack. And if you're doing a valve body, you don't need to replace them. But if you're building the transmission, they come in the kit, and it's, it's good to change them. So this is a real exact fit. So sometimes they're a little bit of a hump to get out. Let's see if we get lucky. Like they pretty much have to be dead straight to come out easily. But you never want to force these if you're taking one of these apart. Because once you force it and it gets cocked in there, you're going to have real problems.
and you could kind of grab it and kind of use that as a little bit of a slide hammer sometimes all right I might have to mess with this off camera because what happens in a snap ring groove kind of gets buggered up a little bit so that makes it even tighter when it's trying to come out so sometimes you have to fight it a little bit and I gotta say I've been pretty lucky doing my videos as far as um, these things not giving me a hard time but I think my luck has ran out give it one more try The other thing that sometimes works, sometimes, not this time, but, oh, yeah. So sometimes if you do that, it'll drop right out for you. So what do we have here? <laughs> More burnt clutches. And this is another clutch pack where we, um, get an extra friction plate in it. Sun gear. Planetary. We'll go into some more detailed inspection later on, but no, I just want to get it apart and get the obvious stuff. Bearing race. Another sun gear. Another plastic washer. This is a compound planetary, right? As opposed to a regular planetary. And this is your clutch drum. So in here, you're gonna have a piston with O-rings. And as you can see, there's a spring in here that acts as your return spring. And look, yet another sprag. So we have plenty of them in here. But luckily they're pretty reliable in these things. I mean, a lot of transmission sprags are a source of um, problems and failures. You know, just by nature, it's a little tiny part. and it's, It works by wedging together and locking your 500, 700 horsepower when a clutch pack applies. So some extreme applications, they just roll over. But typically not in here. There's another snap ring that's under spring tension in here. Another clutch drum with a piston. Now we have another clutch pack in here, and this is something else that we upgrade. I, I may do a a whole rebuild video. You know, I'm not sure what, what time is going to permit, but I could show you some of the upgrades and some of the stuff we've had made to get these things to handle the kind of power that we get them to handle. So this is a special uh, pressure plate. And when we do these to get extra clutches and we have to do machining on this surface and it's a it's kind of a pain in the ass because this is extremely hard stuff so they're very difficult to machine that's why i don't do them here and i send them out you know i have a lathe here for um easy stuff but if it's going to be hard and eat up all my tool bits i send them out so again, these are cooked too. When these things fail, like usually your low reverse clutches, which we didn't get to yet in the back are going to be okay. And sometimes those coast clutches, but when you have a good failure, you're, you're going to have what you see here, which is almost everything's burnt out of it. So down here, we have another spring. And it kind of engages like that on these little castellations here. 
you know, with your clutch pack sandwiched in between it. Starting to get a big pile of crap over here. But fortunately, I know where all the stuff goes to put it back together. another clutch drum. Let's see if we could do that the same way. Not that time, but actually that moved it quite a bit. And if this is not going straight, We gotta knock it in a little bit and bring it out straight. But we didn't get to the difficult part yet. Which is gonna be the next bunch of stuff that we gotta get out of here. There's a center support with yet another sprag. And there's a snap ring that holds it in, and that snap ring's kind of a hump. And then once you get that snap ring out, getting that center support out is often a hump. But hopefully, we'll get lucky and we'll be able to flip it up and give it some taps with a hammer and it'll fall right out. If not, we're going to have a fight on our hands. Okay, not so bad. Let's see if we get lucky here. Not looking too promising. So it got up to where that snap ring sits and like these other components we were talking about kind of gets buggered up in there and um, it stops everything from coming out. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. I think there's our Sprague inner base came out. I think I'm going to be able to get this, but I'm often wrong. So it's just a question of this having to be perfectly straight. All right, so finally through rocking it back and forth, I got it loose. And predictably, your low reverse clutches are good. And your low reverse clutches, as the name implies, 
are on in low, meaning manual low, and in reverse. He's got a little out of sorts, I'm trying to get this support out. So sometimes people ask me this, like they're doing a conversion. And let's say you want to go from four wheel drive to two wheel drive or vice versa. This is what you need to do. You need to change this planetary because the output shaft is built into it. So your two wheel drive is going to have a longer output shaft in it. But as you can see, this is probably not a do-it-yourself project to get down to this planetary and change it. So in here we have another sun gear. There's a bearing and a race here. A bearing race down here. A bearing race here. There's like a barrel bearing down in here. And we'll do a, a full inspection, but this stuff typically stays in pretty good shape. So off camera, we're going to have to get that piston out of there. That's your low reverse piston. And then we could throw this whole case in the machine and clean it up. So I guess the last major thing we want to do is we'll take a look at the pump. Kenny's going to be pissed on Monday because I messed up all his tools. That's what you get for leaving early. <laughs> so there's like one million Torx bolts in here. As you can see, this transmission is pretty level, then it's going to need a lot of work to get it up to snuff. Especially considering the application. This is uh, pretty extreme. You know, I do some of these that, that go out to the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and uh, they kind of kill these things. They're running them in sand. And it's the ambient temperature outside could be 110, 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And amazingly, these things hold up pretty well. So what I did here is I loosened all these bolts and I put two of them back, a couple threads. So I could tap them with that hammer and hopefully I could give this thing a little shot and the pump will come apart. Yep. Got lucky again. So this is what's called a gear rotor pump. You want to look for scoring on the outside diameter, which we don't have. Look for scoring on these lobes, which we don't have. Now if you look at this gear, these tabs are closer to this side than to this side. And also, you could tell how they go because you could see where the converter was touching it. And that's not very good contact. You know, sometimes you could sandwich um, washers. You want to mic them to make sure they're all the same diameter. Sandwich them between the flex plate and the torque converter bolts. And that's going to get that hub further into the pump gears and engage better. And I'll show you this guy, you guys this in another video. This pump bushing is good. So that's, that's a beautiful thing. But the seal drain back hole kind of gets covered by the, the seal. There's not much area. So I'll show you a little trick that we do. Either 
yeah, probably in another video. I'm going to try and do a, a video of putting this thing together. Just the other thing we want to look at, which usually isn't an issue, you want to make sure this surface is perfectly smooth here, which it is. And again, this is the uh, stator bushing. That thing's always, almost always, in perfect shape. I don't know what the one last thing I wanted to go over was. No, well, I guess it'll come to me and I'll uh, do another video. Oh, that's right. Let me get on the other side here. My lovely assistant reminded me. Look at this torque converter. Right? This is where your clutch rides against the um, crankshaft side of the torque converter. And this thing is absolutely blue because that torque converter clutch got so hot. And I have to assume that you were, <laughs> if you were inside this bell housing while this was going on, this would probably be glowing like red in there. So I, I don't even want to um, rebuild this torque converter. You know, there's no way that um, everything in there is straight and not warped. So... This has got to go, but this is extraordinary. Like I've never seen like a Tundra torque converter get blue like this. I've seen it in a bunch of Fords and uh, you know, a lot of diesel stuff, but you know, never in one of these. So this has had a hard life for sure. So that's about all I got for you for now. And then uh, hopefully we'll have some subsequent videos coming up for this transmission. Please like, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell.